Good evening. Uh, I have a question for you. Who here enjoys a good story? Yeah, sure, of course, we all do, right? Um, growing up, I always loved fiction the most and would like hide in my bed reading under the covers, all that kind of stuff, you know. Um, but I have discovered over the years that there are actually some really amazing storytellers out there who can capture my imagination and fascinate me the way that all of those fiction books did, but with, with true stories, real true stories. And um, my pal, Bob Goff is one of those people who can tell a true story and keep me captivated forever. Um, in his book, Everybody Always, Bob shares some pretty cool stories about his life, and he talks about how God is at work and how he sees God working in the world through everyday encounters. And I just love his stories. Um, I would read all of them to you, uh, but we don't have time for that. Uh, but as we were studying and talking about our text for tonight, uh, Joey actually mentioned that there's a story in Bob's book that really fit with what we were talking about. And I was like, all right, I'm all in. Bob Goff, let's go. Um, and I looked at it and I was like, you are so right. This story just parallels this message from God's word. And so tonight, I wanted to start out by sharing that story with you. Um, just to give you some context, in case you don't know Bob Goff, um, this picture, maybe you'll see it. Yes, that's Bob Goff. Look at him. Isn't he great? And that's him with his family, uh, just like a week ago, he turned 60. They had a birthday party. There was like a little horse. I don't know. It's awesome. Um, but that's Bob. And Bob is a lawyer. And he's gotten involved with helping out um, in reforming the justice system in Uganda over the years. In his book, he talks about how he befriended the chief justice of the Supreme Court in Uganda. Um, he now refers to him as the chief. And tonight, the story I want to share um, involves these two, an adventure that they went on together. So Callie's going to share that with you now. Our conversation Is it on? I don't know. It looks like it's on. All right. We're going to go with it. Um, our conversation took a sober turn when we talked about witch doctors and child sacrifice to modern ears this sounds like something that might have happened a hundred years ago, but it's happening now. Almost a thousand children are abducted by witch doctors in a single year in Uganda. The belief among uh, witch doctors is that the head or blood or body parts of their victims have magical powers. They bury them in foundations of buildings and use them for ceremonies um, and for other horrible practices. Thousands of people have been affected, and yet in the history of the country, no one has ever taken on a witch doctor in the legal system. In part, this is because the young victims uh, never survive. The other reality is that many, including judges, are afraid of the witch doctors. I asked the Chief Justice if he would let me be a part of a trial against a witch doctor if we ever found a victim who lived and he said he would. Kabi was head of the witch doctors in his region of northern Uganda. He had no hair on his head, no stubble on his face, and no smile. It was like all the hate in his life had congregated on his face. It was worn and stern, his, and his bloodshot eyes had a yellowish hue. Kabi was the most evil person I'd ever met. An eight-year-old boy, who we'll call Charlie, was walking home from school when Kabi abducted him. Kabi took Charlie into the bush, cut off body parts, and left him for dead. But Charlie didn't die. Once I learned about Charlie, I immediately got on a plane to go see my friend, the chief. And after meeting with Charlie, this young boy that was afraid to make eye contact, I went to meet with a high court judge um, to ask if he'd be willing to have the case against Kabi brought to trial in his court. His office felt heavy as we spoke, as if it were weighed down by the tremendous gravity of the moment. We both knew what we were discussing. It was uncharted territory. The day finally came for the trial to begin. 
Kabi arrived surrounded by a dozen well-armed soldiers. And we videotaped the trial because it was the first in the country. At one point, I saw Kabi look up and stare at the camera. The cameraman's face turned to ash and he pulled his eye away from the eyepiece suddenly. And at one of the breaks, he showed me the video clip. As Kabi stared at the camera, the video fuzzed out to black and white static like a television that stopped working. I assumed the witch doctor's death stare was covered by, the Nikon, by Nikon's warranty, and so we shared a nervous laugh. The next session in the trial would be Charlie's testimony. When the judge reconvened, Charlie entered the room. He was told to tell the truth and was asked about what happened. This eight-year-old kid stood up, pointed at Cobby, and said, that's the man who tried to kill me. Without flinching, Charlie gave the details of what had happened to him. And when Charlie finished his testimony, he got, got off the stand. He looked exhausted, but unshaken. The trial took the rest of the week to finish. A short time later, we received the judge's guilty verdict. We had done it. The first witch doctor conviction in Ugandan history. I was pleased with the outcome of the trial. Justice had been served, and it paved the way for a more courageous stance for these types of crimes against children. But then something happened that I didn't expect. I started wondering about Kabi. Every fiber of my being wanted him to rot in that jail cell that would be the home for him for the rest of his life. And I was okay with that. But my heart felt dark when I thought about Kabi. It felt far from God, and I didn't like it. You know, when Jesus was talking to his friends one day, he pulled them in close and said something that I bet surprised them. He said that if we want to please God, we need to love our enemies. I found it's a lot easier to agree with Jesus than to do what he says. The truth is, I don't want to love, love mine. My enemies are creepy. They're mean and uncaring. They're selfish and full of pride. Some tried to hurt little children. Kids, uh, Jesus didn't come to make my life easy. He came uh, to let us know how to be like him. Now I'm all for that. But does loving my enemies include guys like Cobby? I don't think so. I don't know about you, but as I listen to Bob's story, I feel like I'm right there with him on this like roller coaster of excitement and emotion because, you know, there's this disgust at what these witch doctors in Uganda are actually doing. Like, this is actually happening. And then there's excitement at the chance for justice. They found someone who can testify. And then, you know, a little bit of unease when we hear about, like, hey, witch doctors, you know, they're not as powerful as God, but they, they actually do have some influence. And joy at the trial's outcome. Justice is served. And then he brings up loving our enemies. Loving Kabi? Caring about what happened to Kabi? And right there, that feeling is the one I want you to sit with for a minute. I wasn't there, so I can't say for certain, but I have this feeling that uh, the prophet we're going to talk to, talk about tonight, he maybe felt a little bit of that when God gave him his assignment. See, we've been going through the minor prophets this semester, and this week we're taking a look at Jonah's story. Some of you, you just had flashbacks to like a decorated VBS or Sunday school classroom, and maybe like Tyler, you were sitting inside of a fish and it was amazing. Or maybe you've watched a kid's video on repeat and you're actually like singing songs in your head, you know, Jonah was a prophet. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> Whether you've heard this story a thousand times or not, I want you to set those songs aside for just a minute. See, unlike the other prophets we've talked about this semester, God didn't send Jonah to his neighbors, not to his nation, his people. God sent Jonah to Nineveh. And here's what you need to know about Nineveh. They were the most evil, wicked people Jonah knew. Not only were they horrible, they were really proud of that. They bragged about it. They like painted murals um, with these scenes of the torture that they had evicted upon other people. They bragged about it. Tens of thousands of people in hundreds of cities had suffered physical and mental torture at the hands of these people, the Ninevites, part of the nation of Assyria, for over 250 years during this reign of terror. 
just like Kabi, these were not nice people. So as we listen to Jonah's story tonight, again, I would ask that you set aside those VBS songs for just a minute. Instead, think about Kabi. Think about the Ninevites. And see what Jonah might have been thinking and feeling as you listen to his story. One day, God spoke to Jonah. Get up, I'm sending you to Nineveh. Preach to them, they're in a bad way and I can't ignore it any longer. But Jonah got up and went the other direction, to Tarshish, running away from God. He went down to the port of Joppa and found a ship. He paid the fare and went on board, joining those going to Tarshish, as far away from God as he could get. But God sent a huge storm at sea, the waves towering. The ship was about to break into pieces. The sailors were terrified. They tried talking to their gods, tried throwing things off the ship to lighten the load, but nothing was working. Pretty soon, they figured out this storm was Jonah's fault. He came clean and told them, I'm a Hebrew. I worship God, the God of heaven who made the sea and the land. When they asked him what he'd done, he confessed that he was running away from God. He told them that if they got rid of him, they'd get rid of the storm. He said it was his fault, so they should throw him overboard. The sailors were scared that God would kill them if they threw Jonah over, but they saw no other way out. So they prayed, asking for forgiveness, and then they threw him overboard. Immediately, the sea quieted down. The sailors were no longer terrified by the sea, but in awe of God. They worshiped God, offering a sacrifice, and made vows. Then God sent a huge fish to swallow Jonah. Jonah was in the fish's belly three days and nights. While Jonah was inside the fish, he prayed to his God. In his prayer, he acknowledged how God had saved him from death. He worshiped God and thanked him for hearing his cries and coming to his rescue. Then he promised God, that he would do what God wanted him to do. After three days and nights, God spoke to the fish, and it vomited up Jonah on the seashore. Back on dry land, God again told Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach to them. And this time, Jonah obeyed God's orders and went straight to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a big city, so so big, in fact, that it took three days to walk across it. Jonah entered the city, and as he walked through the city that first day, he preached God's message. In 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. The people of Nineveh listened and trusted God. They proclaimed a citywide fast and dressed in sackcloth to show their repentance. Everyone did it. Rich and poor, famous and obscure, leaders and followers. And when the message reached the king of Nineveh, He got up off his throne, threw down his royal robes, dressed in sackcloth, and sat down in the dirt. Then he declared that everyone had to change their ways. They all needed to fast and dress in sackcloth themselves and their animals. He said they all needed to stop practicing evil and cry out to God for help. He said that if they did that, then maybe God would spare them. When God saw that they had turned from their evil lives, he uh, did change his mind about them. And because of their response, he did not send the disaster that he had threatened them with. Now this made Jonah mad, and he lost his temper. He yelled at God, God, I knew it. When I was back home, I knew this was going to happen, and that's why I ran off. I knew you were sheer grace and mercy, not easily angered, rich in love and ready at the drop of a hat to turn your plans of punishment into a program of forgiveness. So God, if you won't kill them, kill me. I'm better off dead. God said, what do you have to be angry about? But Jonah just left. He went out of the city to the east and sat down sulking. He put together a makeshift shelter of leafy branches and sat there in the shade to see what would happen to the city. God arranged for a vine to spring up. It grew over Jonah to cool him and get him out of his angry sulk. Jonah was pleased and enjoyed the shade. But then God sent a worm. By dawn the next day, the worm had eaten the vine and it was gone. The sun came up 
and God sent a hot, blistering wind from the east. The sun beat down on Jonah's head, and he started to faint. He prayed to die. I'd be better off dead. Then God sent to, said to Jonah, What right do you have to get angry about this shade tree? Jonah said, Plenty of right. It's made me angry enough to die. God said, What's this? How is it that you can change your feeling from pleasure to anger overnight about a mere shade tree that you did nothing to get? You neither watered, watered nor planted it. It grew up one night and died the next. So why can't I likewise change what I feel about Nineveh from anger to pleasure? This big city of more than 120,000 childlike people who don't yet know right from wrong, to say nothing of all of the innocent animals. It's kind of an incredible story, right? I mean, you can see kind of why we, we take Jonah and it's like on the top 10 list of stories we tell to children, right? Um, we've got a storm and a whale, I mean, excuse me, big fish, and we've got good guys doing bad things and bad guys becoming good guys, and there's this vine and worm and wind, and my goodness, why wouldn't we tell this story? It's amazing. Yet in the midst of all that activity and all these players and all these things going on, there's just this one big question that kind of nags at me, and maybe you've wondered the same thing too. Why? Like, why would Jonah run away? Jonah was God's prophet, which means that he knew some things about God, right? He knew God would find him. He probably even knew that running from God wasn't necessarily like on the top 10 list of good life decisions, yet here he is running away. And the answer is actually right there in the story. At the very end, the last chapter, we find Jonah after the Ninevites have, you know, repented, and he's angry again, right? He goes out into the desert to kind of pout or something, you might say. Um, he's super mad, and yet we see what he has to say. In fact, he tells us why he ran. He says, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Why did Jonah run? <laughs> because of the things that he knew about God. See, this statement that Jonah makes there, that statement about who God is, it's actually not the first time that that statement shows up about God in the Bible. It appears in the Old Testament seven times. It's this kind of proclamation, a, like testimony that's known about God. It's not just Jonah's opinion. These are truths about who God is, about his character. God is gracious. God is compassionate. God is slow to anger. God is abounding in love. He relents from sending calamity. Where we find Jonah making this statement, sitting in his anger in the desert, like, honestly, he's just being super honest with God. He's not pretending that he didn't understand what God had asked him to do or that he didn't know how to do it. He knew what God wanted. He knew who God was. He just knew that if he preached, they might repent, and he knew what God would do in that situation. He knew that God would relent and he wasn't actually all that interested in being a part of such a plan. Because remember, the Ninevites were the worst. They were like Kavi. They were these people that we would all want to see that justice story about, not this forgiveness story. Because ultimately, when I think about people like that, when I imagine some of those people in my own life, or even people that just like even a, a fraction that bad, I don't want them to have grace. <laughs> I don't think they deserve a second chance. And frankly, when I think about the people that even slightly compare, people who've hurt me or my family, I don't think that I really believe lasting change is possible for them. See, that's what I've been thinking about as, as I've wrestled through this story for the last week, and I've come to some realizations. Some realizations that when it comes to how I think about change and character, I've sometimes got some things backwards. See, it can be hard for me to believe that people can change. Uh, you know, maybe I kind of like, uh, yeah, that happens, or I see some examples of it in my own life, but when it comes to those people who are different than me that I don't agree with or I don't understand or those people who've actually hurt me or my family, I find it pretty hard to trust them. Even if they say they're changing or even if I see changes, I just kind of doubt that that change could be real. And on the other hand, 
I'm sort of realizing that sometimes I have a hard time believing that God doesn't change. That his feelings and his character, his love towards me, really could be unconditional, really could be no strings attached. But what I'm realizing is that's just completely backwards because the Bible tells us over and over and over that God doesn't change, that he's the same yesterday and today and forever. That's what Jonah knew. (laughs) Jonah knew that if God is gracious and compassionate and not going to change, that meant he would offer second chances if those Ninevites took him up on his offer because it's who he is. So honestly, as I think about it, I think if the story of Jonah is showing me one thing, it's pointing me towards the heart of God, towards all of his creation. See, each of these aspects of God's character just point to this truth that God values all people that he has created. He values the Israelites, the people that he declared from the beginning were his people, but he also values the Ninevites, the people who've been attacking everyone else, the people who are doing everything he says is wrong. He values Jonah and these innocent bystanders, the poor sailors whose boat he got on. He values those who are the furthest away from him and those who have been following him the closest. Everyone. Not because of the things they have done or haven't done, not because of their intelligence or their talent or their wit or their looks, not because of any reason except that he created them. That's it. God's system of value is just completely different than ours. It's simple. Who matters to God? Everyone, period. And when you add together God's character, that grace and compassion and desire to forgive, and you add it to his love, his value for all people, and then you multiply it by his, his care, his desire to be reunited with them, what do you get? You get this relentless plan to reconcile the world to himself, no matter how evil they are, no matter how rebellious, no matter how lost or wicked, God's view is this. They're his. He made them. He wants them back. And he's willing to do whatever. See, that's the other thing I've been learning from Jonah. See, I don't know if people actually can change. Maybe. Maybe they can. I don't know. But even if they can't, Jonah shows me this truth. God changes people. It's everywhere in this story. We encounter people who are like in all kinds of situations and different distances away from God, and yet he meets them where they are, and he shows who he is to them. It makes a way for them to move back into relationship with him, and and then he just gives them that choice. How will they respond? And what's fascinating to me is in this one story, their responses vary so widely. Yet with each of them, God is trying to accomplish the same thing. He's trying to draw them closer back to himself. Because that's the thing. God wants that relationship with them, but he can't change. He is who he is. And so he moves towards them and he offers ways for them to change, to come back to him. And so tonight, that's what I want to take a look at. I want to look at this story and look at these people that God is meeting and how he is bringing them back to himself. And the first group we want to look at It's those sailors. I think the sailors are like the most forgotten in this story. Like nobody talks about the sailors, but here's what you need to know about the sailors. They weren't Israelites. They weren't Ninevites. They just didn't know God. We see that from the fact that like when things start to go bad, they are calling out to all these false gods. And guess what? Nothing happens because they aren't real gods. Um, And so then they get like a little bit scared, right? And they figure out it's Jonah's fault. And well, once he tells them why God's mad at him, that he's like running away, then things like are really pretty fearful because if this guy ticked off a god that can cause this storm, we all got problems, right? Um, What's curious to me is their first prayer to God is out of fear, right? They're terrified, but still God hears their prayer, right? Because though they don't want to do it, they throw Jonah over and God heard that prayer. He knew where their heart was and as soon as they toss him, what happens? The storm stops. Like, can you imagine it? You've got raging chaos and wind and rain just like pelting their face and they're on this tiny boat in the middle of the ocean and then stillness, stillness. I just imagine them dropping to their knees. (laughs) They've been in chaos and now everything has, has ceased. Their faces might have been covered in tears as they marveled at the true power of a God who can cause a storm and stop it in an instant. Is it any wonder that their hearts were turned towards belief? that they were humbled. 
I can imagine them on their knees as they offered these sacrifices and made vows to this God. See, for the sailors, God met them on that sea, and he moved them from ignorance to an awareness of who he was, from that fear to this awe. And so what did the sailors do? They worshiped. The second group we have is the Ninevites, and as we established, not good people, right? People who were doing bad things, people who were proud of doing bad things. So honestly, if you really think about it, it's shocking. Like day one of <laughs> Jonah showing up and people are like left and right. They're saying, yeah, we believe God. Yeah, that sounds bad. Let's do something about it. And they're fasting and sackcloth is like changing your clothes to kind of symbolize the fact that you are repentant, that you're grieving, that you're sorry for what you did. So lots of people changing, but you're like, okay, those are the common people. And so when we get to the king, I kind of expect him to be like, no, I will remain in power. You cannot take my kingdom from me. But no, he's like, yeah. We better, like, we better accept this. Like, God's real. He's not messing around. And he tells everybody, like, we're all doing this. Put sackcloth on your animals. I don't know if that shows up anywhere else. It's kind of funny. Like, well, I don't know. Anyway, he's, like, all in, right? Maybe, maybe if we repent, maybe if we say yes to God, he will spare us. And what I love about this part of the story is that God tells us, it tells us that God saw their actions. See, the Ninevites didn't just like sign a petition. Jonah wasn't going around like one of those people on campus like, here, sign this. Like, it wasn't that. This was like full, all-in repentance. Like, we hear what's coming for us. We're changing our direction. God moves these Ninevites from all-out rebellion to this amazing repentance, this amazing surrender of who they've been and change of their ways. They didn't just say the words and try to get out of things, try to make excuses. Their actions were seeking after changing their position before God. The third, the third party we have, obviously, is Jonah. Oh, Jonah. <laughs> Jonah knew who God was, right? We've already established that he knew all these things about his character and that he was on God's team. Yet in Jonah's story, it's just this roller coaster of responses. He's all over the board with God. One second, we have Jonah in defiance, you know? He's like, I don't care what you say, God. I hear you, and I'm not in. And he's running, like that runaway child. I will get as far away from you as I can. But that's the point where I feel like God probably should have written him off and just said, like, I've got other prophets. I'll send someone else. But God doesn't give up on Jonah. Like, he makes a storm happen, and this fish save Jonah, all so that he can, like, redirect Jonah's, like, heart towards him. So, so then the fish swallows him, and I just, like, I don't know about you, but I've heard this story so many times. It struck me for the first time that when Jonah went overboard, like, he didn't know that fish was coming, right? So, so the fact that when Jonah's in the fish, he's suddenly praying and thinking, God, kind of makes sense. He was surprised by this fish, yet here God is, in the face of his rebellion, bringing him back, providing a way out. So I just see Jonah there, like, in the belly of the fish, and it's, like, kind of gross, and there's things floating around, probably. I don't really know. But, like, I see him there on his knees, and those hands that had been raised in defiance to God, now offering thanks to him and saying, you saved me, you heard me. And so it kind of makes sense that when he shows up, you know, back on dry land and God says, okay, I want you to go, like, he's like, all right, I'll obey. And I think where he was running away before, I kind of see him more walking this time. He's walking in obedience. I don't know that he was running in obedience, but he did what God said he should do. So he's following through on God's plan, and it's working. It's working really, really well. And then he's mad again, right? So he sees God's compassion, and he's angry about it again. But this is kind of my favorite picture of Jonah because he's angry and he goes out and he's like, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to watch. I'm going to see what happens. And God, again, could have left him there. Like he taught Jonah this lesson one time. He saved him. He redirected him. Why is Jonah running away again? But God goes out and he uses a vine and a worm to try yet again to bring Jonah to this picture of what his heart was. See, God wasn't giving up on Jonah despite this roller coaster of emotions and responses and, and disagreeing with God. God still wanted Jonah on his team. He still wanted Jonah to understand his heart for people in the world. He still wanted bring, to bring Jonah closer to who he was and who God wanted him to be. Their responses are as different as their stories, yet for each of these people, God's desire was the same. Reconciliation, bringing them back to him. 
he was willing to use every means possible to do it. In fact, the story of Jonah is just actually a foreshadowing of that truth about God's um, will for his people. See, Jonah wasn't all wrong in his view that justice mattered. It does. He just didn't see how far God was willing to go to accomplish both justice and mercy. God took the ultimate step to draw people back to himself when he sent his son to take our punishment. See, sin has a price and it's steep, but God made a way for all people to be made right with him because Jesus took that punishment. Jesus accomplished justice by dying in our place and not only won this victory over sin, but he won that victory over death when he raised again three days later. That's God's offer. He took punishment. He achieved justice so that we could have mercy. He made a way back to him, but it leaves us with the choice of how to respond. If you've never responded to Jesus before, I have to ask you tonight, what do you say? See, that offer is there. Will you accept that mercy and grace that he offers? Because he wants you. He values you. Because He made you, and that's it. It doesn't matter what you've done or not done. He wants relationship with you. And if that's something you want to talk about tonight, the offer is always open. Any one of us on staff would be more than happy to talk with you about that. Here's the thing. Responding to God is not a one-time deal. When we say yes to Jesus, we're saying yes to becoming more like him and less like us, which means God wants us to keep moving closer to him, learning more about his character, more about his view of the world, just like he was teaching Jonah, and then responding to it. And as our friend Bob pointed out in his story, it's a lot easier to say we agree with Jesus than to actually start doing something about it. So, you want to hear what happened when Bob actually did what Jesus said? The minute he attacked Charlie, Cobby became my enemy. He wasn't a little evil, He was pure evil. And it's easy to talk a good game about loving your enemies until you have one. I realized that if I wanted big things to happen in my life, I'd need to take bigger steps and risk more than I had ever before. So I decided to visit Kabi in in prison. Kabi entered the dark room where I was waiting. He had no shoes and was wearing a torn and dirty prison uniform. When he entered, he took a knee and told me how bad he felt about what he had done to Charlie. Skeptical, I thought he was just sorry because we had caught and punished him. He told me what it was like growing up the son of a witch doctor and what witchcraft had done to him over the course of his life. And then he said something that stunned me. He said, I know I'm going to die in here. What I really need is forgiveness. Forgiveness for a witch doctor who tried to sacrifice Charlie? My immediate reaction was absolutely not. He tried to kill this little boy that I love. But something inside of me had started to change. I didn't see a killer in front of me. I felt like I was looking at a criminal hanging on a cross next to Jesus. I thought of the words Jesus spoke to that criminal. Today you will be with me in paradise. Kabi and I talked for a long time. And then something happened that will forever shape my understanding about the things Jesus talked about. Kabi said he wanted to put his faith in life in the strong and kind arms of Jesus. When he did this, you could say he was coming to Christ, as many people in faith communities would. But in a way, I was too, because I was moving away from just agreeing with uh, Jesus and thinking that we should do what he said when he talked about loving my enemy. Who could have imagined this would be possible? Well, that answer is simple. Jesus did. Loving our enemies has always been his idea, not ours. The people who creep us out aren't obstacles to having faith. They're opportunities to understanding it. If you want to become love, Stop just agreeing with Jesus. Go call someone right now. Lift them up in ways they can't lift themselves. Send them a text message and say you're sorry. I know they don't deserve it. You didn't either. 
My guess is that you don't know any witch doctors. I know I don't. And you may not have heard a really specific direction from God telling you what to do or where to go. I actually haven't either. Here's the thing. When we agree to follow Jesus, we actually are all immediately given some pretty specific directions. Things like love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, go and make disciples. Some of the how, the where, the who, it may be left open um, and vague. It may look like different things at different times in your life. But if we're followers of Christ, we are all called to tell people about him, even the people who are different than us. Those we don't understand, don't like, those who don't think, we don't think deserve it, those who've hurt us or hurt someone we love, everybody. Second Corinthians tells us that since we have been reconciled to Christ, we have been given the ministry of reconciliation because God is in the business of reconciling the world to himself. If we're going to be on his team, then he wants us to be his ambassadors. He wants to send us out on his mission, on his behalf. That's who God is. He loves us and wants us. His heart is to draw us back to himself and then to make us like him. For us to learn to be these little beacons of light and love to everyone, everywhere. But he gives us a choice in how to respond. It's up to you. So will you raise your hands in defiance and anger? or in surrender and worship? Will you be running from his call or are you going to reach out and grab his hand for this adventure that he's inviting you to join him on? No matter where you are tonight, I want you to know one thing. God wants to meet you there, but then he wants to draw you further, to bring you closer to him. So the question is, will you let him? How will you respond?